Good afternoon. It is about 2.45 p.m. on Tuesday, the 1st of March. I hope everybody is doing well today. we got a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, one of which is the Enlightenment. We're going to talk also about the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and a little bit about what happens afterwards as well. So let's start with the Enlightenment. The beginning of the Enlightenment is kind of hard to pinpoint. There's not an exact date. It's not like somebody woke up and said, hmm, I'm going to be enlightened today. Uh, when you talk about the Enlightenment, generally speaking, somewhere between 1687 and 1715, in 1687, Isaac Newton, he published the Principia Mathematica that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. And then 715 is the death of Louis XIV, the King of France. Now, the main principles of the Enlightenment, they can be simplified to these, quote, self-evident ideals like life, liberty, equality, um, representation, constitution, social contracts. Uh, and this belief system, it's going to be used to change the world during the 1700s and the social system of the day will be challenged. The political system of the day will be challenged. A couple of names I want you to know, a couple of people I want you to know. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Denis Diderot, he is a Frenchman who came up with a book known as the Encyclopedia the Rational Dictionary of the Sciences, Art, and the Crafts. And he wrote it in 1751. Uh, today, the dictionary is just a big book of words, but the original dictionary, it was a 17 volume work that attempted to teach people how to think critically and how to think objectively. And Diderot was a big fan of the sciences, a big fan of industrial arts. Uh, he kind of, he questioned matters of religious faith and he openly criticized social and political institutions. Another person I think you should know is Montesquieu. And in 1748, he wrote a book called The Spirit of the Laws. And he was a very, very big supporter of the idea of constitutions. And he advocated heavily for the idea that becomes known as checks and balances. It is Montesquieu who comes up with the idea of separation of powers that we use today. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau writes a book known as The Social Contract. And within The Social Contract, he asserts that there should be a moral equality and a legal equality to all mankind, that the people should be sovereign, that the people should have the say in what happens in the government, not just one person, and that the general will of the people should be respected. Jean-Jacques Rousseau goes on from there to argue that people had lost their natural state of freedom and their natural state of equality to government authorities. In other words, Jean-Jacques Rousseau felt like people had given up many of their rights and governments have gotten too strong. The fourth person I want you to know is Adam Smith. And Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. And let me actually fix this. I just realized I have a typo there. So Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in the year 1776. And he is going to argue against the idea of mercantilism. In mercantilism, it was believed that was only so much money, only so many resources in the world. And Adam Smith is going to change the idea of the scarcity of goods. He's going to change the idea of a scarcity of resources. And he is going to say, you can make money. Self-interest alone, according to Adam Smith, is enough to drive the economy forward and 
this idea of self-interest and making money develops into the philosophy that we know today as capitalism. And capitalism is based on expanding resources and an ever-growing economy. Another group of people, and they're kind of lumped together, these are the enlightened despots. Enlightened despots are going to be absolute monarchs who also allow the ideas of the Enlightenment into their ruling style and into their countries. I would say the most famous of these enlightened despots is Frederick the Great of Prussia. Prussia is today part of Germany. And Frederick the Great, he attempted to improve agricultural methods and business methods using in, uh, the Enlightenment ideals. He tried to codify and simplify the Prussian legal system, and he tried to improve the conditions of the peasants. He tried to make the life that the peasants lived better. You also have Catherine the Great of Russia. Uh, she created a new legal system in Russia and increased education and literacy for the upper class. Um, side note, Catherine the Great also was not Russian. She was actually a German who married a Russian and then had the Russian murdered so that she could become the ruler. The third of these enlightened despots is Joseph II. Um, Joseph II of Austria, along with his mother Maria Theresa, they attempted to reform the tax system of the Austrian Empire uh, they created a completely new judicial system that protected the peasants, and they eventually abolished serfdom. They got rid of the peasants. Joseph II, he established freedom of the press, freedom of the religions, and a literacy program as well. Now, it's important to know that Maria Theresa is not truly considered an enlightened despot, because a lot of these changes she made because she thought it would make her hold on power stronger. Joseph II of Austria did it because he wanted to actually make the conditions of his country better. But they worked together to make Austria a better place. All right, the American Revolution. I'm not going to go too far into this because it's something that you should probably already know. But I'll talk about it anyways. The first thing is you've got the Seven Years War. Seven Years War starts in 1750s and it goes until 1763. It is won by Britain. It's fought mainly between France and Britain, but there are other people involved as well. Uh, French colonies, British colonies, the Spanish get involved, the, the Dutch, you name it. It's actually a worldwide war. Once the Seven Years' War is over, there's this rapid population expansion and there's rapid economic growth that happens in the American colonies. And this led to growing pressure to expand past the Appalachian Mountains. The problem is a law called the Proclamation of 1763 kept that from happening. The land west of the Appalachian Mountains was supposed to be reserved for Native American people. The land east of the mountains was meant for the British settlers. But in reality, a big part of it was just the simple fact that the British did not want to pay for the, um, the care, the treatment of protecting the settlers who tried to go west of the Appalachians. Well, in the end, the occupation of the lands west of the Appalachian Mountains is going to cause a huge upkeep in, in costs. And to offset the costs and to help pay for the cost of the war that the British Parliament felt was started by the Americans, taxes were put on the American colonists to help them pay the war costs and help them pay for the upkeep of troops in the colonies. The Americans did not like this and they did not like this at all. So what ends up happening is protests, they break out against Britain, 
do the new taxes placed on the colonists. Uh, shopkeepers, merchants, and printers, they organized something called the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty. The Daughters of Liberty and the Sons of Liberty both advocated for boycotts of British goods. Eventually, the Stamp Act was, was uh, taken away. If you don't know what the Stamp Act does, or did, I should say, and if you don't remember what the Stamp Act did, they put a tax on paper goods, and it mainly affected the middle class, the merchants, and the upper class. Now, the protests, like I said, they lead to the repeal of the Stamp Act, but they're then replaced by taxes that are even worse, known as the Townsend Acts and the Tea Acts. And the Townsend Acts put um, taxes on just about everything you can think of. When we get to 1770, the Boston Massacre occurs when colonists protest against these off-duty soldiers. Fighting breaks out, and from there, stories, both false and true, are spread throughout the colonies, and this revolutionary spirit really begins to take off. Now, the War of Independence itself can be traced to 1775. I know a lot of people say 1776, but in reality it started in 1775. Um, in 1775, there's a set of skirmishes that happen in Massachusetts. They become known as the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is passed in July 1776. But even before that, the Second Continental Congress meets in May of 1776, kind of like a last ditch effort to find a peaceful solution. But much like the events that are happening today, King George III had made up his mind and war begins. Now we, everybody knows who wins the War of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, 1776 of July. The Articles of Confederation becomes the first government. It doesn't do so well. And then eventually the U.S. Constitution is created in 1780s and comes into power in uh, 1783. Not 1783. 1789. Once the war is over... A system of checks and balances is put into place in the U.S. Constitution. The Bill of Rights guarantees people representation, um, but it's not all-inclusive, of course. Um, voting rights are restricted to white males who own property until the 1820s. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag there, but you know those are all things that you have heard in, in American history all your life, basically, but have talked about it again. The French Revolution may be new for some of you. And this is all because of King Louis the Sixteenth. King Louis the Sixteenth intervened on the side of the Americans in the American Revolution. And King Louis the Sixteenth spent a lot of money that he just didn't have. And this led to a financial crisis that absolute monarchy was just not prepared to, to fix. Uh, Louis XIV, the great-grandfather of this king, made a lot of his money from selling titles and selling offices in exchange for immediate payments. Now, if you bought a title, if you bought an office in the early 1700s or the late 1600s, it meant that you and your family never had to pay taxes again. So Louis XIV, in exchange for this immediate payment, he gave up a ton of tax revenue that his ancestors would need in the future. So by 1788, the French government's completely out of money. Louis XVI is starting to freak out, trying to figure out how to pay for everything. And he goes to his finance minister, a guy named Jacques Necker, and they together try to reform the tax assembly. And they go to a group of people known as the Assembly of Notables. Now, the Assembly of Notables was not a legal body. Uh, they could only give recommendations to the king. And Jacques Necker and Louis XVI, they pro propose having a single land value tax. 
Uh, they want to turn corvée tax into money, meaning you can no longer work off your, your debt. You have to pay tax. And then they would get rid of the internal tariffs. They would stop the, they would lower the cost of trading within France to try and in, increase uh, the amount of money, the amount of tax money that's going through the country. And to get the assembly of notables to go along with this, they say, hey, we will give you elected provincial assemblies. Now the assembly of notables, they liked the idea, but they said, you know what? We're not the right group of people to make this decision. They said, go to the, um, to the parliament of France or parliament of Paris, I should say. Well, the parliament of Paris in 1788 was nothing more than a legal court. And the legal court says, we can't do this. You have to call the estates general for a meeting. Now, the problem with the estates general is they hadn't met between 1614 and 1789. So there are a ton of questions on what to do. There's a ton of uncertainties on how it works. And it just nobody knows what's going to happen if the estates general is called. Now, the estates general, it consisted of three estates. You have the first estate, which was made up of the Catholic clergy, and it was about 100,000 people or so. They didn't pay taxes. The second estate was made up of about 400,000 nobles. That's who Louis XIV sold a lot of their titles to. And they're mostly, except, um, they're mostly not paying taxes because they're living off of bought and paid for titles. Then you have the third estate, which was t about 25 million people. And they are, in reality, the only ones who are guaranteed to pay taxes. The estates general meets. All three of the estates have to figure out how does this even work? It's been so long since anybody has met underneath the name of this, this group. So uh, let's figure it out. Well, throughout the meeting of the Estates General, it became clear that the elected representatives of the Third Estate wouldn't be listened to. The first two estates were going to gang up on the Third Estate. And members of the Third Estate walk out of the meeting. They go next door to a tennis court, and they give the tennis court oath on July 20th of 1789. And in the tennis court oath, the Third Estate renames itself the National Assembly of France, and they vow not to separate and to reassemble wherever necessary until the Constitution of the Kingdom is established. And this walking out of the meeting and the giving of the tennis court oath, that is the beginning of the end for Louis the Sixteenth. Now, the French Revolution begins July 14, 1789. That is Bastille Day. The Bastille was a prison slash fort in Paris. And the Bastille was important because that is where most of the political prisoners of Louis XVI were held. Now, I could do an entire two-hour lecture easily on the French Revolution, but I know you don't have that much patience. So let me just kind of simplify it for you. Uh, first thing, it happens really in three different phases. The first phase is the constitutional monarchy phase. That's 1789 to 1792. Louis XVI and the National Assembly try to work together. Noble titles are abolished. Church property was nationalized and then it was sold to the highest bidder. But that breaks down and Louis the 16th is going to try and flee the country in 1792. He thinks the best way to get his power back is by going next door to Prussia and then leading a war against his own people. The second phase is known as the radical republicanism phase. That's 1792 to 1795. Uh, Louis the 16th and his wife Marie Antoinette are captured attempting to flee they're returned back to Paris and both the king and the queen are put under house arrest the National Assembly then declares war on Prussia 
and Austria, which is where a lot of the families who supported the king had gone to. The National Assembly then holds brand new elections, renames itself the National Convention, and writes its own constitution. Somewhere in there, a vote is taken on what to do with the king and the queen. It's decided that they are both liabilities, and it's voted on and decided to chop off the head of both Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. Once that happens, the Committee of Public Safety is created, and the Committee of Public Safety is not about public safety. Uh, their job is to arrest anybody who is thought to be an enemy of France, and best estimates are over 30,000 people die in what becomes known as the Reign of Terror. And the, late, the Reign of Terror is led by a guy named Maximilien Robespierre. The Committee of Public Safety, they ban all self-government, they ban all individual liberties. There's none of that until France had defeated all of its enemies. Now, who were all of its enemies? Whoever the Committee of Public Safety said they were. Once that's done, from 1795 to 1799, we have what's known as the Military Consolidation. Uh, one of the things that the Committee of Public Safety did was uh, they completely changed the dates of the calendar and July became known as the month of Thermidor. Um, and the Committee of Public Safety collapses in July of 1795 and this is known as the Thermidorian Reaction. Uh, Robespierre himself is beheaded and the Committee of Public Safety is taken out of power and replaced by something known as the Directory. The Directory creates a second constitution and a bicameral legislation is created. Now the Directory was kind of weak and they used the army to keep control of the people and to keep the government stable. And the fact that the Directory itself was unstable and it was the army keeping everything in control led to this guy named Napoleon overthrowing the government. And Napoleon, as it shows here, that's him, uh, he launched a successful coup against the Directory on November 9th of 1799. And once this, this coup is successful against the Directory, Napoleon names himself First Consul. Now that is significant because First Consul was the title that Julius Caesar had. Napoleon completely dissolves the National Assembly. Napoleon appoints a Senate that he controls. And then in 1804, with the, with the vote of the people of France, he names himself the Emperor. Now, as Emperor, he bars all organized opposition. He censors and closes the newspapers and he has a secret police to keep the people in check. He also creates something known as the, the Napoleonic Code. And the Napoleonic Code is a new legal system that let one person choose their occupation. It allowed you to receive equal treatment under the law, and it lets you have true religious freedom. The bad side, though, is the code outlawed strikes, it kept you from getting a divorce, and it took away the property rights of women. So there's some good in there, and there's some bad in there. It just depends on, you know, what your view was at the time. Now, eventually, Napoleon is going to attack Europe. He attacks England, he attacks what will become Italy, he attacks what will become Russia, and he attacks even as far east as this, the Russian Empire. The whole point of this was to create a French Iber, um, Empire that would be as big and as powerful as the British Empire. Now he, get, he comes pretty close to this. Napoleon is going to defeat Prussia and create this trade union known as the uh, Zollverein. And he creates a continental system 
of trade that is completely and totally dominated by France. It is a, a trading system where France benefits heavily because of all the trade. Eventually, though, Napoleon oversteps his bounds. Uh, he tries to invade Russia in the fall of 1812. Uh, it doesn't go well for him at all. And during the Russian campaign of 1812 and 1813, Napoleon loses, oh, somewhere around 500,000 troops. I mean, no big deal. And this ends up leading to his grand defeat at the Battle of the Nations in October of 1813. And it takes the combined army of Great Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia to bring him down. Once Napoleon is defeated, he's sent on a vacation to the island of Elba, which is just a little bit south of the coast of France. Uh, he has a pretty good lifestyle there, but he escapes on March 1st, 1815. Um, he goes to the southern coast of France. He is restored to power. He declares himself willing to accept a constitution, and he wants to be a peaceful leader for the good of the French, but nobody trusts him. Nobody believes him. Um, another fight breaks out. Napoleon this time is defeated for the final time. June 18th, 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. Now as for Napoleon, when he is defeated the second time, he gets a second island vacation. But the second island vacation is down near the coast of Brazil. And Napoleon is going to end up dying, actually, of arsenic poisoning. Somebody poisons Napoleon at the end. Well, what happens after? Well, after the defeat of Napoleon, what's known as the Quadruple Alliance, that's Great Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, they make it their job to set out and restore all the European monarchies that Napoleon had messed up. And they're also going to try and stop the ideas of the French Revolution from spreading. Now, much of that work fell to this Austrian nobleman named Clemens von Metternich and a meeting known as the Congress of Vienna that went from 1814 to 1815. So maps of Europe are going to be redrawn. A system of alliances will be created to try and stop any revolutionary movements. France sees the monarchy restored with the brother of Louis the 16th. This is going to be a guy named Louis the 17th. I know, creative. Louis the 17th is forced to rule with the constitution, but when he dies in 1824, he's replaced by his brother Charles the 10th. And Charles the 10th wants to be an absolute monarchy, and um, his absolute monarch attempt will fail in 18, excuse me, 1830. Finally, Charles X will be replaced by his cousin, Louis-Philippe, and eventually in the year 1848, Louis-Philippe himself is going to be overthrown. In Great Britain, liberal forces demanded more voting rights and better working conditions. Uh, protesters for better working conditions, uh, call, they are protesting and the British army opens fire on them in what becomes known as the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. Uh, soldiers fire into a crowd of over 60,000 people who are demanding government reforms. Eventually in Britain, the 1832 Reform Act will double the number of males who are able to vote. And by 1884, uh, suffrage rights are extended to all male households, no matter how much money they have or, or um, where they come from or anything. In Italy, rising nationalism led to the unification of many formerly independent territories under the leadership of the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. And your one set of your documents for this week are going to be on this unification of Italy. Um, there is a little bit of legalese, there's a little bit of politicking, so make sure that you read the set of readings two or three times so that you understand it. But led by Count Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont Sardinia's uh, 
King Victor Emmanuel II. Um, Count Cavour is going to provoke Austria into a war that leads to an Italian victory, and the Piedmont Sardinian government is going to claim territory all over northern Italy. At the same time, in southern Italy, there's a freedom fighter named Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, who takes over the kingdom of the two Sicilies in southern Italy, and then he is going to present his territory to the king of the Piedmont Sardinia kingdom. So Italian unification, it begins in 1848 and it's completed by 1870 when Italy takes over the Papal States of Rome, which results in the modern day Kingdom of Italy. As for Germany, same thing, you've got some German documents to read this week. During the 1850s, Prussia wanted to unite Germany under its leadership. But Austria, who is a German state, continually blocked that. Uh, so the leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm I, and his minister, Otto von Bismarck, they had to figure out a way to make this unification happen. So Bismarck is going to manufacture a couple of wars. Uh, for example, Bismarck used an attempt by Denmark to unify two provinces, the province of Holstein and Schleswig, uh, to start a war with Austria. This created a patriotic movement and Prussia was able to take over the two provinces of Holstein and Schleswig. Bismarck is then going to use a crisis over who inherited the Spanish crown to start a war with France. Uh, it turns out that a member of the Prussian government was next in line for the Spanish uh, crown, but a member of the French government protested it. Um, war starts between Prussia and France over who is going to be the next leader of Spain. It grows from there and France has a humiliating defeat in less than six months. The Prussian kingdom annexes the territory of Alsace-Lorraine and Bismarck and Kaiser Wilhelm II, the first, I'm sorry, Kaiser Wilhelm I are going to declare the formation of the German Empire in the year 1871. All right, so that's a lot of stuff in about 30 minutes. You may want to watch this video a time or two just to make sure you get all the concepts. And if you don't get all the concepts, of course, you know, send me an email. I am more than happy to answer emails and help you any way I can. Another thing I want you to notice here is that your midterm exam is next week. It will be available from 3.8 all the way until 3.14 and it must be proctored. Now I'm telling you it must be proctored because number one, I don't want you to wait till the last minute in case the Respondus lockdown browser doesn't work. And also because you may need to go in person to one of the West Georgia Technical College locations to do your test. Um, either one of those is okay, whether you do it in person in the library or if you do it through the Respondus browser. The important thing is that you do it, of course. Um, I'll give you some more information on that either uh, tomorrow, which is Wednesday the 2nd, or Thursday, which is the 3rd but I will be sure to get you out more information on the midterm. All right, that's it for this week. Um, reflection paper number two is due this week. And for reflection paper number two, use any of the readings from the discussion five, discussion seven, or discussion eight this week. So those three sets of readings you can use the rules and the expectations are the exact same as reflection paper number one. If you don't remember what it is, just take a look at uh, the video from the first or look at the syllabus or send me an email and I'll help you out with that that way. All right, that's it. Until next time, good luck. We're all counting on you. Get your reflection papers in, do your quiz, do your discussion, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.